Act 2, Scene 7. So once again, we start with our plot overview on our post-it note. In Act 2, Scene 7, the Prince of Morocco chooses the gold casket, and we learn that this is in fact the wrong choice. So Scene 7 sees us again in Belmont at Portia's house, so we know that this is the land of romance rather than um, the land of the merchants in Venice. We see Portia speaking in imperatives at the start of the scene. Go, draw aside the curtains and discover. And she says, now make your choice. She's trying to spend as little time as possible with the Prince of Morocco. And she doesn't want to converse with him more than she needs to. So the instructions are very direct. Now, the Prince of Morocco uses his first speech um, for Shakespeare to remind the audience that there are, in fact, three caskets and three choices. Remember, we've got um, an audience of varying intelligence, and so every so often Shakespeare will just remind us of something that we've already heard so that we can continue to follow the, with the plot, because as you've seen, we're skipping between scenes from place to place and storyline to storyline. So he reminds the audience that we've got um, a gold casket, and it says, "'Who chooseth, chooseth me shall gain what many men desire.'" We have a silver one, who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. And we have a dull lead casket, who chooseth me must give and hazard all he hath. Now, we've been reading this quite carefully, so we will remember that this is a father who is putting together a choice um, for the right husband, a moral man, to be able to choose his daughter. So it might seem quite clear to us, as a modern audience reading this very slowly, which casket is going to be the correct one. That's not going to be quite as clear to the Prince of Morocco, so we're going to have a look at his decision. So Morocco starts talking about the different caskets and how he views those caskets, what he thinks of them. He starts at the, the bottom, the cheapest. He starts with lead, and he's quite shocked at the idea that he would hazard for lead he says that this casket threatens men that hazard all do it in hope of fair advantages. He doesn't like the idea of, of fate or of fortune or of luck. And we've seen that this is a theme that's taken us through each one of the scenes, but he doesn't like the idea that um, he may lose something. He's not prepared to hazard. Then he moves on to the silver and he talks about the virgin hue of the silver and we're reminded of Portia in that description. He articulates his thought process as he goes through looking at each one of these caskets. He talks about the fact that um, thou dost deserve enough and yet enough may not extend so far as to the lady. He doesn't want to just get enough. He wants everything. He wants to win Portia. And we see a level of arrogance and overconfidence in this description. He believes Portia's value will be shown through the metal in the casket. And he links Portia's value to a monetary value. But what he doesn't do is focus on this idea of self-reflection. He doesn't see the moral messages on the casket as in some way testing him. He does, however, remind us of a line that Bassanio said in Act 1, Scene 2. He talks about the fact that men are travelling from the four corners of the earth to come and win Portia. So he reminds us again how precious Portia is, how many men are willing to risk all they have to marry her. As we go on then, he goes back through the caskets and he starts to question, is it likely that lead contains her? He says, to a damnation to think that so base a thought, it were too gross to rib her. So he says that no, this material is too base for her, it's, it's too cheap, it, it isn't the sort of material he would associate with Portia. He then looks at the silver and he says, oh, that's a sinful thought. Never so rich a gem was set in worse than gold. 
And again, he's talking about her value and he reflects on her value and considers her value to be equivalent to the gold casket. And at this point, he decides to ask for the key. Deliver me the key. Here I do choose and thrive I as I may. So he's decided that he's going to open the gold casket, at which point Portia does not try to stop him. She doesn't continue the conversation. She doesn't elongate this process. She says, take it, prince. And if my form lie there, then I am yours. Now, there are varying interpretations of that. Um, perhaps she is um, succumbing to her fate. Um, perhaps she's fearful that he will choose her. And perhaps she just wants it to be over with quickly. As Morocco opens the gold casket, we see that his language changes. And he now starts to use highly emotive language. He's very passionate because he realises that he's lost everything. He says, Oh hell, what have we here? A carrion death within whose empty eye there is a written scroll. So what he's actually been given um, is a skull. And inside the eye hole of um, the skull, there is um, a piece of paper and that delivers a message to him. It's quite unchristian language in this point when he says, oh, hell, um, but it's because he's so emotional. Um, he's not, it's not that he's deliberately trying to be rude. He's just quite upset because he's lost the opportunity to marry Portia and the opportunity to marry anybody else. And we're reminded of the moral message that the father was trying to teach. All that glisters is not gold. Often have you heard that told. What he's reminded is that just because something looks valuable, it doesn't necessarily mean that it, it is the right choice, that actually we have to reflect, we have to be willing, and we, we come to realise that it's the lead casket we're looking for, we have to be willing to hazard everything, we have to be willing to risk everything, to give up everything for Portia, because that's how we show our love for her. Now, at the end of the scene, Portia is um, very relieved that he hasn't selected the right casket and she says a gentle riddance she wants morocco to leave she hasn't enjoyed this process and it's created an element of tension for the audience this is act two scene eight now act two scene eight we return to venice and salarino and solanio gossip about jessica running away they then mock Shylock's sadness at the loss of his money and of his daughter. And the two men then discuss ships that they have heard have sunk and they worry that these could be Antonio's. Everything in this scene is gossip amongst these two men and we must remember that it's those two speaking and that we don't have direct speech from other characters. So like we said, we're back in Venice. So we know this is going to be a discussion about money. Now, the discussion begins um, with Salarino and Solanio talking about the uh, movement of Bassanio over to Belmont um, and then the loss of Jessica. So Lorenzo and his amorous, his love, Jessica. Now, it seems that Shylock has been searching for his daughter and he believed that his daughter was on the boat with Bassanio. But Antonio certified the Duke they were not with Bassanio and his ship. This is an example where we get to see that Antonio's word is good for anything he puts it to. So because Antonio said that Jessica was not on the ship with Bassanio, everybody has absolutely believed him. Now... Solanio goes on to discuss, again through this reported speech, how Shylock reacted once he realised that his daughter had run away and had taken his money. Now it is deliberately done through reported speech so that we don't get to see Shylock's emotions and we can find this to be a comedic scene rather than one that would create sympathy for his character. We might feel sad that Shylock's daughter has run away. We might feel sad that she has stolen money from her father and behaved in such an inappropriate manner for a daughter. But because we're hearing two men gossip about it, they get to report it in a way that the audience would have felt much less sympathy for him. 
So Solania says, I never heard a passion so confused. He talks here using these strong adjectives as well that um, that Shylock was overcome with emotion, that he was mourning a loss. So strange, outrageous and so variable as the dog Jew. Now, please remember, this is not the first time we have heard Shylock being called a dog. And if you recall from previous videos, we discussed the fact that um, a Jewish character would find being called a dog so offensive because um, they were banned from parts of Israel and they were believed to be very dirty, very vicious animals. So this is a, a very strong insult that we have here against Shylock. And we hear that the dog Jew did utter in the street. So he's running through the streets, apparently, saying these words. My daughter, oh my ducats, oh my daughter. Now you'll see within this line the back and forth between the daughter and the ducats. The ducats being the form of money that they had in Venice at this time. And it looks at first as though the daughter is valued most highly because of the way daughter is repeated within the line and ducats is only said once. But actually, if you take all of the reported speech that Shylock has, we hear that money is mentioned 12 times and daughter is only mentioned six times. So the way in which Solania reports this emotional outburst of Shylock, it makes it look like Shylock cares more about his money than his daughter. It also looks like Shylock was particularly upset that she fled with a Christian. Oh, my Christian ducats. The fact that his daughter has not only left him but has changed religion is particularly upsetting to him. And the suggestion is that he is particularly upset that his money has gone to a Christian as well. And we see that Shylock was abused by um, even young boys in Venice who follow him through the streets crying his stones, his daughter and his ducats. So it's as though young boys from the city have been following him through the streets, mocking him, shouting after him. And the two men are gossiping about this as though it's a form of entertainment. Now the scene then ends with a bit of foreboding. So let good Antonio look, he, he keep his day, or, sh or he shall pay for this. So we have a sense of foreboding here, that something is about to happen to Antonio. And this links into the last bit of rumour and of gossip that we hear. Salarino says that he has heard um, from a Frenchman that there miscarried a vessel of our country richly fraught. I thought upon Antonio when he told me this. So he's heard tale that um, there has been um, a ship that has perished at sea and he believes that it may be Antonio's ship. Solanio reminds him that that would be um, a very difficult thing for Antonio to hear. So he says, yet do not suddenly tell him for it may grieve him. And we're reminded in this moment um, that Antonio is such a good man. A kinder gentleman treads not the earth. It's a lovely quotation to remember about Antonio, that he is well respected by all of these characters, that they believe he is such a good man. And we're reminded of something very lovely that Antonio did for Bassanio. So as Bassanio left, he said, and for the Jew's bond which he hath of me, let it not enter your mind of love. So he said to Bassanio, who's left for Belmont, don't think about the bond, don't take the worries about money with you to Belmont. Now that fits with the description we've had so far of Belmont, which is that it's not a place of money, it's a place of love. It also shows us how kind Antonio is, because he hasn't wanted to burden his friend Bassanio with any worries about the money and about the bond. He's just told him to go, to win Portia, to fall in love and to enjoy this moment. We, the audience, though, at this point, we are starting to feel quite worried for Antonio because if that is his ship that has perished, then we know that the bond, remember, was to exact a pound of flesh as the payment. And we don't want that to happen to Antonio because, as we've heard, a kinder gentleman treads not the earth. 
This is Act 2, Scene 9, and it is the second of the suitors. So, again, on our yellow post-it note, we're writing down the plot, and we've written that there is another suitor, the Prince of Aragon, who chooses a casket. This time, the silver casket is chosen, which again is incorrect. And at the end of this scene, we see the arrival of um, Bassanio and his messenger in Belmont, and so the audience becomes quite excited because we know we're about to get to the, the real choosing of the casket. So once again, we have circled that we're in Belmont. We know that this is the world of uh, fairy tale, fantasy, love. Um, we start with Nerissa telling us that the Prince of Aragon has taken his oath. Um, now, two things here. One, we've underlined Aragon, and you could put down that his name is supposed to tell us a bit about his character, so we should know that he's quite an arrogant man from his name. And also the fact that he's had to take this oath, so he's had to swear to certain rules about the casket choosing. And if we turn over the page, we're going to hear what those rules are. So much like the Prince of Morocco reminding us that there were three caskets of three different metals and telling us the inscription on each of them, and that was Shakespeare, remember, reminding the audience um, of the choices that could be made. Well, here Aragon acts um, as a reminder again. So Shakespeare has him telling the audience that there are um, three parts to the oath that all these suitors must take before they make any choices. So the first part is that he must never unfold to anyone which casket was I chose. So he must never tell another person which casket he has selected, because obviously that would make the choice much easier for anybody who comes after him, and that would be cheating. So he cannot tell anybody. The second one is that if he fails to get the right casket, he must never in my life woo a maid in way of marriage. So it's much more serious than not just getting to marry Portia, we actually hear that he could not marry any woman. He must never woo any woman at all. Now, during this period in which the family name and the family wealth would be passed down through the sons, um, this is actually quite an important moment because he is promising never to have a wife and therefore never to have legitimate children that he can pass his name on to. So this is a really big decision that he has to make. And the last part is that if he fails... He must immediately to leave you and be gone. So he must leave Belmont as soon as he has failed the casket test, if he does fail. Now, Portia in this moment um, is going to be the direct opposite to the Prince of Aragon. So he's going to be quite an arrogant man. And she here shows um, quite a self-deprecating element to her character. She says that... Um, she feels quite bad for all these men who have come to hazard for my worthless self. And she talks about herself using worthless to suggest she doesn't feel that um, she has enough value to give these men, that they are risking too much for her. So we've said that Aragon is an arrogant character, and we see this now as he goes through the three choices. So he starts by looking at the gold chest. And the gold chest says um, that you shall gain what many men desire. And he says, many may be meant by the full multitudes that choose by show. So he distinguishes himself from the masses. He says that he doesn't believe he is um, as lowly as the masses, that he is better than them. He also says that he won't choose by show, so he's not being misled by the fact that it is gold. So he is going to make a different choice to the Prince of Morocco, who, if we recall, was led by the material. He then goes on to discuss the next casket. So he goes on here to talk about um, who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. Who chooses me shall get as much as he deserves. And we start to see the building of grandeur after this. Now, the repetition here, where he keeps talking about how many, how many, how much, again, we're building the drama at the end of this speech. 
And he says, he repeats it again, who chooseth me shall get as much as he deserves. I will assume desert. So he assumes in this moment that he has a birthright, that he is as good a man as could be, that he deserves this woman. And so he asks for the key to the silver chest. Now, Portia says that there is a long pause when he opens the chest, which again builds the drama on the stage. You've got to remember that this is being performed, so he would stand there quietly for a moment. And Aragon is shocked, and we can see that through his next speech, where we see, what's here? And then, did I deserve no more than a fool's head? Is that my prize? Are my desserts no better? So there are four questions here. That is because he believes that he should win her, and yet, when he opens the casket, there is nothing more than the portrait of a blinking idiot. So there isn't a portrait of Portia. He says, how unlike my hopes and my deservings. So he's really very shocked that he hasn't won her. And he then gives a speech where he reads out the inscription that has been left inside the silver casket. So much like the Prince of Morocco found um, a piece of paper with an inscription inside the gold casket, we have another rhyming verse inside the silver casket. And here we see a juxtaposition between a very serious game, one in which he has just lost the right to marry any woman, and a rhyming verse which sounds quite humorous. And in this moment, we're reminded that it is a play that's a comedy. So although something quite serious has happened to this man, we're encouraged to think about it in a light-hearted way. Now, we've, we've done away with two suitors so far. So the Prince of Morocco has chosen the gold casket and has failed, and the Prince of Aragon has chosen the silver casket and has failed. And we end Act 2, Scene 9, with the arrival of a messenger who declares that a young uh, Venetian man is about to approach the house. And it's the excitement that we feel because we know it's going to be Bassanio. So we hear that there is this young Venetian, um, that he's brought gifts with him. And he is described as an ambassador of love. And so everything is lining up to suggest that Bassanio will woo and marry Portia, that he will choose the right casket. And the excitement that the audience feels is mirrored by the excitement of the women at the end of this scene. Portia asks for no more to be said because she's getting quite anxious about this. She longs to see Quick Cupid's post that comes so mannerly. And Nerissa says, Bassanio, Lord, love, if thy will it be. She ends by wishing it is Bassanio who turns up. And so we end the scene with that small tension. We're hoping it's Bassanio. The women are hoping it's Bassanio. We've seen two men fail. We now know for certain that it's the lead casket that needs to be chosen. And so when Bassanio is standing in front of them, we, the audience, are going to be willing him on to choose the right one. We know which one he needs to choose. And Portia now knows that as well. So there's a lot of tension that has been built up by the end of Act 2, Scene 9. <laughs>